you can hear me okay. Got a good microphone here. All right. Well, uh, last Sunday, uh, we uh, talked a little bit about uh, Jesus' second coming. Uh, now, remember that it seems that there's two, uh, two phases to Jesus' second coming, what we call the second coming. There's the rapture of the church that takes place first. And then sometime after that, you have, uh, and in that, in that situation, we'll talk more about that later this morning, maybe, or not, not this morning, next Sunday. But um, Jesus, in that uh, situation of the rapture, uh, Paul says that Jesus appears in the clouds, the trump of God sounds, the dead in Christ are raised first, and those who are alive and remain are caught up together to meet them in the air. Uh, and that's the rapture of the church. And then the second advent, which is the second aspect of the second coming, uh, Jesus comes all the way back to the earth. He sets his feet on the Mount of Olives and he establishes his kingdom here, which we will be talking about this morning. So uh, aren't we glad that Jesus is coming back, Amen. man? And uh, I thought about singing our Lord is coming back to earth again, but I think maybe with my vocal cords the way we, they are, I, I won't do that, okay? I'll spare you, all right? <clears throat> But uh, so, so at the end of the uh, at the end of the tribulation period, uh, Jesus uh, comes all the way back to the earth, and the second advent here concludes the second coming of Christ. Now, we were talking uh, last Sunday also about the resurrection of the dead, and uh, Myrna said that we I confused her so. Uh, I'm going to try to see if we can clarify some things here this morning. Uh, in John chapter 5 uh, and verse 28, Jesus uh, makes it clear, if you'll turn with me to John chapter 5, verse 28 and 29, uh, Jesus makes it clear that there are two resurrections. Do not, uh, this uh, verse 28 of chapter 5 of John, St. John, do not marvel at this. For an hour is coming in which all who are in the tomb will hear his voice and will come forth. Those who are dead, uh, those, those who did goods to, good deeds to a resurrection of life and those who committed evil deeds to a resurrection of judgment. Now you say, uh, Brother John, uh, that could be just one resurrection. And that's true. Uh, if you just read that verse. Uh, but what we're talking about, and that emphasizes something that we need to understand about the resurrection. When we talk about the first resurrection and the second resurrection, as we will see uh, in, in Revelation, we talked about last Sunday, I'll look at that again here this morning. Uh, the first and second resurrection is designated first and second, not so much because of the timing of them as it is the quality of them. The quality. There'll be a resurrection of the righteous, and uh, and there'll be a resurrection of the wicked. And so, the first resurrection uh, means uh, those who and and the scripture says, "Blessed is he who is in the first resurrection," and uh, that'll be the resurrection of the righteous. The resurrection of the wicked, and now so let's uh, go on now to. Uh, 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 let me see here. I'm trying to make sure I'm not leaving anything out. Um, I don't have it on the slide, but in Revelation chapter, let's go back, go to Revelation chapter uh, 20 and read verse, the latter part of verse 4. Verse 4 is a very long verse in Revelation chapter 20. And so I'm only going to read the last part of the, the verse. Uh, and they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Okay? They came to life and re reigned. And he's talking about uh, those who are, are redeemed. And we'll say a little bit more about them in just a little bit. And then the, the rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years was completed. This is the first resurrection. Now, uh, the first resurrection refers to those in, in chapter 4, and the rest, the rest of the wicked dead are not raised until after the millennium. So, uh, 
here's what we know about the first resurrection. At least for the most part, it will occur before the millennium, and I need to even qualify that. You see, it gets confusing because Scripture doesn't lay this all out in chronological order for us. Uh, scripture is very often very unconcerned about cr uh, chronological order. I mean, it's not that it's not important. It is. But we have a lot of Scripture where we're told about a lot of these things, and the chronological order of them is not clarified. And so we, what we have to be willing to live with is we know it's going to happen, okay? We know it's going to happen. And so it appears that the first resurrection uh, as to quality, that is the resurrection of the righteous, will be in various phases because we know that there's going to be a resurrection at the rapture. And yet we also know that there's going to be people who are saved after the rapture and could possibly die. In fact, during the... Uh, 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 during the uh, uh, tribulation, uh, there'll be people who will give their lives for the, for the Lord Jesus Christ. And unless you take a post-tribulation uh, rapture view, uh, which I find very, very uh, difficult, then uh, uh, you're going to have people resurrected after, after the uh, rapture of the church. And as strange as it may sound, and we'll talk more about this too, we can talk more about everything, okay? Okay. Uh, uh, during the millennium, uh, the millennium will consist of people who have natural bodies and those of us who have glorified bodies. So in the millennium, we'll have both glorified people and uh, natural people. And again, I see no, uh, given the uh, significance or the, uh, what the millennium is all about, which I'll we'll talk more about later, I'm talking about resurrection. I'm trying to talk about resurrection now. Uh, uh, given the purpose of the resurrection, I believe that there could be people who uh, will decide they're going to go with, Je hopefully they're going to go with Jesus Christ. So uh, what's going to happen to those people? Well, if they happen to die, they're going to have to be resurrected sometime. And so uh, for the most part, the first resurrection is completed before the millennium. Uh, and... Uh, that's about as good as, I, as good as I can do on explaining that. And then the wicked dead will be resurrected, uh, we know this for sure, after the millennium. Myrna, does that help clarify that for you? Some? Okay, a little bit of shaking our head, yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, so uh, a after the first resurrection, then... Yeah, you want to be sure you're in the, uh, I tell you what, somebody said, uh, they don't know, they said they don't know if they're ready for the, for this load right now or not. Well, you better be ready for this load because it might happen just any time. So uh, if they, if they start getting the load up, well, you better get on board. All right. Uh, all right. Now, uh, uh, we've already talked about that only believers uh, then so after and again it's it's very difficult to clarify all of this chronologically but what we know here with regard to judgments is there'll be two kinds of judgments there'll be the judge the judgment of the righteous and then there'll be the judgment of the wicked it appears that uh, the judgment of the righteous, again, it's very closely connected to the first resurrection. So you have some of the same problems with regard to the judgment of the righteous as you do with regard to resurrection because they're not going to be judged until after they're resurrected. So when, when we think of the judgment seat of Christ here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, if you would like to turn that to me with me too, and then uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, I'm sorry that that's part of the way off the screen. I'm going to have to remember that and keep things in bound for these screens up here. Uh, but I'll give you that verse here in a minute. That's uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. So I have a tendency at least to think when I read about the judgment seat of Christ, we're all there together and, and Jesus is up there and he's judging us, okay? Well, it may not be that way at all. It could be that I'll be in there by myself. 
and you'll be in there by yourself, and you'll be by yourself. And so you understand what I'm saying? Uh, there's nothing that says that this is a group situation. That's the way I think of it. That's the way I, I think it's going to be. But uh, what I'm saying is uh, there could be a judgment seat of Christ situation as soon as the rapture takes place. And then if there's people saved during the uh, tribulation as they're, uh, and, they're, and they're resurrected, they stand before Jesus Christ. What we know is we're all going to stand before him. That's what we know. We know we're all going to stand before him. And then after the millennium, another, uh, some more uh, judgment of uh, believers. So, again, the Bible doesn't clarify all this chronological business. What we know is there's going to be two resurrections and there's going to be two judgment scenes. And they are divided with regard to the quality of the individual. That is, are they born again or are they not born again? Is their name in the Lamb's Book of Life or is their name not in the Lamb's Book of Life? And so here's what Paul says in, uh, I've got so many markings in here, I think I'll be able to get to it. Here, here we go. Uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, if you want to turn there, quickly or you can look it up sometime later uh, Paul says very simply we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ and there's where we get the terminology so that each one may be recompensed for his deeds in the body according to what he has done whether good or bad so now Paul says all he's talking about all of those individuals whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And then in 1 Corinthians, and if you want to turn there with me, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, uh, Paul is writing about this again. He says, uh, talking about this situation of uh, standing before Jesus at the judgment seat of Christ, Now if any man builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, or straw, each man's work will become evident. Uh, uh, might not know about the quality of the work now, but you're, there's going to come a day when everybody will know about the quality of our work. According to each man's work. Uh, for the day will show it because it is to be revealed with fire. And so the wood, hay, and stubble are going to all burn up and all there's going to be left is gold and silver and precious stone. Uh, and the fire itself will test the quality of each man's work. Then uh, uh, Paul further qualifies, verse 14, If any man's work which he has built on remains, he will receive a reward. Paul says we're brought into this situation to be recompensed for our deeds. Then he says... Another qualification in verse 15, if any man's work is burned up, in other words, it's, if it's all wood, hay, and stubble, and it's all burned up, what's going to happen then? If, a man, if, a man's, uh, if any man's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. So there's the judgment seat of Christ. And uh, those that will be believers. And uh, now after, after this, uh, okay, we, Jesus has, uh, at this point, Jesus has come back. He set his feet on the Mount of Olives. The Mount of Olives split wide open. And uh, where are we going to from there? Well, we're going to the millennial reign of Christ. Now, this is a very interesting subject. Uh, but the book of Revelation only gives us uh, about four verses. <laughs> and uh, so uh, we're going to look at that. And so if you want to turn with me to uh, Revelation chapter uh, 20, where we have uh, this. Uh, the millennial reign of Christ, uh, Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 4. Now what we read here, in fact, I'm going to read it, I guess. Uh, then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding the key of the abyss, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold upon the dragon, the serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the abyss, and shut it, and sealed it over him, so that he would not deceive the nations 
any longer until the thousand years were completed. So, uh, what about this? Well, this is where, uh, G uh, let me back up just a little bit. Jesus uh, started his kingdom on earth when he, when he came the first time. He was preaching about the kingdom being. And so we are, there's a sense in which we are in the kingdom of Christ right now and have been ever since Jesus came. But it, uh, the phrase that's often used is already but not yet. It's here, but it's not completed yet. It's not uh, completely developed yet. And so Jesus brought in the kingdom. But now the kingdom is in a situation where there's good and evil and there's battle back and forth with regard to that and that's the situation we're in today and we're, and we're living in mortal bodies. And so the kingdom has already started. And so what we're having here again is another phase kind of situation. The kingdom comes by phases. It came, started when Jesus first came. And now we're going into the situation uh, that we call the millennium. Uh, Satan is bound for those thousand years. Now, there's, uh, and uh, what, what, what description did we have of Satan there? I thought that was interesting. Uh, laid hold of the dragon, the old serpent, the guy that showed up in the Garden of Eden, you remember? Um, the devil, Satan. So, I guess, uh, what is that, four different things? I guess we're supposed to uh, understand that there's no question about who we're talking about here. There's no question about what we're talking about. We're talking about the literal personification of evil in, in Satan. And so he will be bound for a, a thousand years. Now, there's various views on, this, on the millennium. And we've talked a little bit about this before, but here's the time for us to uh, go over this and make sure everyone understands. Uh, there's three uh, primary views, uh, premillennial, all-millennial, and post-millennial. And uh, with regard to these, uh, there's uh, some who believe that this is going to be a literal kingdom of uh, Jesus here on earth. Jesus is going to physically come back to earth, and he's going to set up a kingdom in the millennium uh, and where he's going to be personally reigning over that kingdom. That's my belief. Uh, but then there's some who believe... Uh, uh, that uh, the only kingdom of Christ that's ever going to be is the kingdom in the hearts and the lives of, of believers. We believe in a literal thousand-year reign of Christ physically actually here on this earth ruling and reigning in that kingdom. Uh, we believe in the, I believe, in the premillennial reign. That is, uh, Jesus... And I almost have to go to post uh, millennialism and all millennialism to explain pre millennialism, so I guess I'll, I'll, maybe I'll do that. All millennialism means no literal kingdom of Christ here on earth. That's the one that proposes uh, the no kingdom except Jesus' kingdom in the hearts and the lives of believers. Uh, post millennialism, the terminology here can get a bit confusing. Um, postmillennialism sounds like uh, it almost sounds like a contradiction in terms it's going to be after the millennium that Jesus is going to establish his kingdom no that, that's, that doesn't make any sense at all so what's the post well postmillennialism means after the church has established the kingdom of Christ here on earth then after the church has established the kingdom then Jesus comes back and just takes over the kingdom in other words, this belief was, and almost, I don't know anybody that really believes this anymore, I don't think. Uh, the belief was that the church was going to be uh, exceedingly successful. Uh, there would be more and more born-again believers. Uh, the world was going to get better and better and better. And as soon as Christianity had just totally, almost totally taken over the earth, and the kingdom is there, then Jesus is just going to come and take it up. And an interesting thing about that is that this was an exceedingly, exceedingly popular view in the uh, 
uh, in the 18th and the 19th and even part of the 20th century. And that kingdom was going to actually be the United States of America. It seems to me that it hasn't turned out very well. And so uh, God had uh, uh, established the United States, uh, the United States, the Christian nation, and going to send missionaries all over the world, and things were going to get better and better and all over the world, and pretty soon the kingdom would be there, and after that all happened, Jesus comes back. I'm afraid that that's been shattered. And it began to especially be shattered with World War I. And World War II just about knocked it completely out. And it seems to me that we've got a lot of evidence today that the United States is not going to be the millennial kingdom of Jesus. And so, no post-millennialism, uh, no all-millennialism, pre-millennialism. And what we mean by that is Jesus Christ is going to have to come back himself to establish his rule and reign. Uh, it's not going to get better. More likely, it's going to get worse. Uh, and so uh, things are corrupt, and they're going to continue to be corrupt until Jesus comes back, and he himself will establish his kingdom here on earth, premillennial, for a thousand years, literally. Uh, everyone understand that okay? If you have a question... Uh, raise your hand and I'll repeat your question so the people listening can hear. But is, is that all clear enough for everyone? Okay. So Jesus comes back and uh, literal reign here of Christ. And then uh, I thought uh, that I, even though, okay. I, now what I read to you there in Re Revelation chapter 20 verses 1 through 3 is uh, and four is all you have about the millennium in the book of Revelation. And it seems kind of strange to me <laughs> in that that's a thousand years. A thousand years. Now, it's true a thousand years in eternity might be this, about the length of the snap of your finger. But in my lifetime, that's about ten of them. I think, uh, or more, okay? So a thousand years, my point is, in anybody's book, even from God's perspective, it seems to me that a thousand years is quite a length of time. It's not just a day or two. It's quite a length of time. And so immediately the question should arise, what's the purpose of this? What's the purpose of this? Why take another thousand years? Let's just go into, the, in, into eternity and get it over with, okay? What's the purpose of this? There must be some purpose to this thousand years. What could it be? Well, before we, before we go there, if you'd like to turn to these uh, scriptures uh, that I have up here on the PowerPoint uh, that are, see, the, uh, the millennium, is like a, a lot of other topics in Scripture. In fact, it's like, like it is with most topics in Scripture. Uh, the, the Bible is not uh, primarily divided by subjects. You don't read chapter 1, and that chapter 1 is about one subject, and then chapter 2, and that's another subject, and then chapter 3 is another subject. And No, it's not that way. You get a little bit about this topic here, and you get a little bit about this topic here, and here, and here, and here, and here, okay? And the fact of the matter is, we don't have very much information at all about this long thousand-year reign of Jesus here on earth. Uh, we know it's, it's going to happen, and we're told a few things. And so, in Isaiah uh, chapter 9, uh, verses uh, 6 I thought I had this in the right place, but maybe I don't. Okay, here we go. Yes, I remember now. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through six through 7. For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us. Who's that? Lord Jesus Christ. And the government will be upon his shoulders, the millennium. And his name will be called Wonderful, 
Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, P, uh, Prince of Peace. And there will be no end uh, to the increase of his government and of peace. And the throne of David, uh, on the throne of David and over his kingdom, to establish it, to uphold it uh, with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore. We know this is future because there's never been a kingdom of Israel or any kingdom forevermore. There's coming a forevermore kingdom, okay? The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. So, there, we, there you have a millennial passage. Jesus is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and he's coming to establish his kingdom. And this will be a kingdom that will be forever. He will, he will be over the government, and it'll, and it'll be a time of peace. A time of peace. And I didn't look it up, but there's a scripture that talks about Jesus ruling with a rod of iron. And the reason why he's going to rule, have to rule with a rod of iron is because there are going to be wicked people here during the millennium. But he's going to keep the peace. He's going to keep the peace. Now, another one there is, Revel, uh, excuse me, Isaiah chapter 6, uh, verse, uh, chapter 11, excuse me, verse 6 through 9. The wolf will dwell with the lamb, and the leopard will lie down with the young goat. Well, that sounds pretty interesting, doesn't it? Uh, what, uh, what if you had a wolf and a lamb together today? I think the lamb wouldn't last very long. Uh, but the wolf's going to lay down. With, uh, what about a leopard and a young goat? Young goat's not going to last very long. But the wolf's going to dwell with the lamb. The leopard's going to lay down with the young goat. A calf and the, and the young, fat, uh, young lion. Calf and a young lion. Okay. And the, and the fatling, uh, flatling together. Okay, anyway. Uh, my lips are real dry here. And a little boy will lead them. Also, the cow and the bear will graze together. Cow and a bear. If you want to go get a bear hug, you can. Today, I wouldn't advise it, okay? Okay. Um, uh, the, uh, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the oxen. And the nursing child will play uh, by the ho uh, hole of a, a cobra, and the weaned child will put his hand on the viper's den. What's the point being made here? Things are going to be a whole lot different during the millennium. We're going to take a gigantic step back to what it was when God first created the heavens and the earth and he put uh, Adam and Eve in the garden to rule and reign over these things. Uh, and it's interesting to me that one of the things talked about here is how uh, carnivorous animals are going to be eating, uh, eating plant material. In my opinion, just to kind of add a parenthetical here, uh, that's the way it was to begin with. The, it's, uh, uh, animals killing animals is a result of the fall. You see, the animal kingdom, the whole world and the whole universe was affected by the fall. And so the lion, when it was first created, ate grass. And... Uh, uh, we, we're we supposed to be vegetarians. Now, don't hold me to that right now because I like my bacon and my ham, okay? Uh, but uh, the fact of the matter is I can't... Uh, I have to go to the New Testament to find uh, it okay for me to eat that stuff uh, because to begin with, it's very specific in the book of Genesis that G and, and why would he mention it if it wasn't important? In the book of Genesis, it says... And I've given you all these plants to eat. I've given you all these plants to eat. He doesn't say he's given us all these animals to eat. It appears to me that if he's going to tell us we can eat the plants, if it's okay with him, he's going to tell us we can eat the animals. But he doesn't. Anyway, so much for that. What I do know is that animals that today kill other animals are not going to kill other animals during the millennium. There's going to be that kind of peace. And then uh, I, Isaiah chapter 51 uh, okay, Isaiah chapter 51 I tell you what, I think I'm going to skip that one and go to Isaiah chapter 65. 
Okay. Well, I'm close to 50. 51. I'll just read it. 51 verse 3. Uh, Indeed, the Lord will comfort Zion, and he will comfort all, uh, all her waste places, and her wilderness will be like what? Like Eden. Going back to like it, something like it was before the fall. Um, and her desert, like a garden of the Lord. Joy and gladness will be found in her. Thanksgiving and joy. Uh, uh, thanksgiving and a sound of melody. So there's another millennial passage. Now Isaiah chapter 65. Isaiah chapter 65 is uh, verse 25. Excuse me, uh, 19 through tw 19 through uh, 19 through whatever. Okay, um, verse 19 of chapter 65, Isaiah. I will also rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. You know, there's been a, a many, many, many times when God has not been very glad about his people. Many times he's been very, very disappointed about his people. But there's going to come a time when he's going to be glad about them. I, I will also rejoice in Jerusalem and be glad in my people. And there will no longer be heard of her the voice of weeping and of sound of crying. They'll, there's never going to be heard in Israel again the sound of weeping and crying. No longer will there be a, an infant who lives but a few days or an old man who does not live out his days. For the youth will die at the age of 100. In other words, if you, if you die at 100, you're going you're gonna to be a youth. Well, that sounds good to me, you know, except I'm planning on having a glorified body by then. So, okay, but uh, I mean, you know. Uh, and the one who does not reach the age of 100 will be thought of as accursed. So things are going to be different in the millennium. Things are going to be different in the millennium. And in Isaiah chapter 65, verse 25, uh, Isaiah repeats uh, something he said earlier. The wolf and the lamb will graze together, and the lion will eat straw like the oxen, uh, and the dust will be the serpent's food. Uh, they will do no evil or harm in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. And then uh, Ezekiel, uh, one passage in Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 36, and uh, verses... Uh, uh, 30, what, I, what have I got up there? 33 through 36. Okay. Thus says the Lord, this is Ezekiel chapter 36. Thus says the Lord God, on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will cause the cities to be inhabited and the waste places will be rebuilt. The desolate land will become cultivated instead of being desolate in the sight of everyone who passes by. They will say, the desolate land has become like the Garden of Eden. There we go again. And the waste, the desolate and the ruined cities are fortified and inhabited. Then the nations that are left around about you will know that I am the Lord. How many of you know the nations around don't know that God's the Lord? Well, maybe they do. They're just sticking their heads in the sand or something. Uh, have, have rebuilt the ruined place and planted that which was desolate I, the Lord, have spoken it, and it will be done. So, I hope you see what I mean. Number one, go all over the place to find these scriptures that give us some information about the millennium. Uh, number two, we know it's going to be a time of peace. We know Jesus is going to be here ruling and reigning in, purpose, uh, in person. Uh, apparently, there will be... Uh, uh, those of us with glorified bodies and there'll be people who are natural bodies and the righteous will be ruling over the rest. And so that's the reason why I was saying a while ago, uh, oh, and uh, let me, let me uh, make sure before I move on here, um, it appears to me, and Peter Clark and I were talking about this the other day, it appears to me uh, well, maybe I should click one more slide before I do that. 
after the after the thousand year reign, Satan is released. God, have you got this right? You sure you, you, you got this? <laughs> he does have it right. <laughs> Uh, but man, you got him confined. Why not just keep him there, you know? In other words, here we go again. What is the purpose of that thousand-year reign of Christ? The only thing I can figure is uh, Satan is, is released, and what does the Bible say that Satan does after he's released? He goes about... He, go, he goes about... He goes about doing, I guess, the only thing he knows how to do. He goes about deceiving. Uh, Satan is about nothing else but to steal and destroy and kill and disrupt. And incidentally, all of that stuff is of Satan. So be careful about participating in any kind of stuff like that, okay? Uh, so... He's going to go out and he's going to deceive the natural people of the millennium. And there will be, he will be able to gather a multitude of people. A multitude of people. What? Are you, are you serious? Is the Bible right about this? He's, gonna, he's going to gather a multitude of people and try one more time to, re, uh, to rebel against God. He's going to lead these armies against God. Where are these people going to come from? They're going to come out of the millennium. Now, these are people who for a thousand years have seen Jesus Christ in person. Somebody says, if I see it, I'll believe it. Well, if you believe it, why don't you act like it? They will be seeing Jesus ruling and reigning here for a thousand years. They will see the peace. They will experience the joy. And yet, after all that time, they will still have their mind made up that God is not going to rule their lives in their opinion he has no right to rule their lives and therefore Satan will gather them all together against Jesus Christ one more time uh, I also uh, you know and, and this is just a thought that came to me take it or leave it okay uh, you know I've often thought about and discussed with individuals the fact that it seems to me that it is not logical that God would ever take away our free will. He will not, he's, he created us with a free will. He's not going to take that away. So what about in heaven? glorified bodies what if somebody messed it up like they did the first time there's going to be no sin there there's going to be no sin there now the only thing I can figure out is nobody there is ever going to want to sin they're not going to be tempted again and in their glorified bodies you know what I'm saying and I wonder if a thousand. This is this. I shouldn't even be speculating this way, uh, Peter. If you want to edit this out, sometime you can. Uh, a thousand years might be a test as to whether or not we're going to live it out. <laughs> Beth, you start to say something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The millennium. Uh, uh, yes, she's talking about people having a, another chance. I, I really do believe that. I believe that during the millennium, it, it seems totally unlike God to have natural people here during the time that Jesus is ruling and reigning here and those people not have an opportunity to receive him as their Lord and Savior. And that's what the end of the millennium is going to show. 
They didn't. I believe some will, but uh, that's, uh, I don't have absolute scripture to, to say that. So, oh my goodness, uh, we are, uh, let me see what's next on this thing here, see if we, uh, then after, after the, uh, and we'll talk a little bit more about this next Sunday, but after Satan is released, we talked about their uh, Gog and Magog, longtime enemies of Israel and God, and uh, so uh, this, uh, in my opinion, represents all who oppose God. We'll talk a little bit more about that when we come back next Sunday. So uh, let me uh, emphasize one more time, and I certainly will do this again next Sunday too, that we're living in the last days, and it looks to me like that we could be living in the last of the last days. And John tells us in a scripture I'll look at next Sunday that when you seeing the spirit of Antichrist like we're seeing today, he says, you know the hour is near. Now, here's what you need to do. Nobody knows the day nor hour. Don't know whether it's going to be sometime today or, God forbid, a thousand years from now. But what we know is he's coming soon. And so what we're, what we're told to do is to be ready. Lord bless you. See you back here next Sunday.